Now I'm very excited to introduce our keynote presenter. We had the good fortune of being introduced to Kristen Grauman about 10 years ago, shortly after she started her academic career. What she's accomplished since then is really impressive. I was particularly drawn to three aspects of Kristen's work, which we'll hear about in her keynote this morning. The first of these is multimodal perception, which I already touched on briefly. The second is first-person perception, meaning enabling a better understanding of the world through cameras worn by a person or mounted on perhaps a machine that's interacting with the world. This, of course, is very relevant for augmented and uh, virtual reality, but it's also super relevant for mobile robots, assistive devices, and many other applications. And the third area is data. As we saw from the survey, Training data is a big pain point for many of us. And there have been a few bright spots, like ImageNet, for example. Uh, but you'll hear, as you'll hear from Kristen, she and her colleagues have organized a really ambitious effort to create a large body of training data for first-person perception. In fact, so much of the work that Kristen and her team has done is relevant to our community that we really had a hard time deciding which topics to ask her to cover in her keynote given finite amount of time. So let me reserve as much time as possible for Kristen's talk and just complete my introduction very briefly by saying that Kristen Grauman is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Texas at Austin and a research director at Facebook AI Research. Her research in computer vision and machine learning focuses on video, visual recognition, and action for perception. Before joining UT Austin in 2007, she received her PhD from MIT. She has been recognized with numerous distinctions, including being named a Sloan Fellow, a Fellow of the IEEE, and a Fellow of the AAAI. She received the 2013 Computers and Thought Award from the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence. She has been the program chair for CVPR, NeurIPS, and ICCV, and was inducted into the UT Academy of Distinguished Teachers. Welcome, Kristen. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here and see you all this morning and get to share some of our recent results. This is a talk aimed at a broad audience, so I'm trying to give you kind of a hint of the problem, well, hopefully more than a hint of the problem, but a hint of the solution and examples of what we're able to achieve so far. And I'm gonna focus, as Jeff just introduced, on elements of first-person perception, and especially those that are multimodal in nature. So that'll mean we'll get into vision plus audio, vision plus language, and, and I'll give you examples that kind of connect towards that vision of embodied AI. So let me set the stage starting right there, talking about where we've been in computer vision and where we really need to go and where so much work is needed to, to, to move. So here's where we've been, and where we've been is in a field is achieving some great successes in terms of visual recognition of objects and activities and images and videos like you see here. I'm showing you kind of the the hall of fame of important data sets that have really driven the research in the field in order to allow those great accomplishments. ImageNet, Kinetics, Ava, and others. Now, what you'll notice though, is that these instances of images and video have a certain form. They're typically downloaded from the web and they make their way into these computer vision or AI data sets. And this means they represent something special in fact, they're curated by human photographers originally, and so they represent this curated disembodied moment in time from a third person or a spectator's perspective. Right? These are the moments that were important enough to take a photo, take a video, and now they get into the hands of our AI agents. But let's contrast what that is to what we receive when we talk about the first person or egocentric perceptual experience. I'm showing you a video from a head-mounted camera of a person going about some daily life activity in a grocery store. And you can see that that 
curated notion of content, it's no longer there, right? We're not just seeing those special moments that are worth capturing, we're seeing every moment. We're also seeing it with a good deal of head motion, motion blur, all these problematic things. But in this challenging, uncurated, long form video, we're also seeing something really meaningful, which is we're observing the world not, a, not as a spectator anymore, but as a window into the agent's goals, their actions, uh, interactions with the environment and their attention. And this is true whether we're looking at human capture content like this or um, the egocentric view of a, an autonomous robot. All right, so this transition is what I'm talking about, going from third person understanding of the world to first person um, front row seat, egocentric understanding of the world. This is where we need to make a lot of progress. And indeed, the field is looking how to broaden from the status quo of disembodied learning and images and video towards this world of understanding agent goals, interactions, and importantly, multi-sensory observations. And this will have broad implications for what we're able to do in augmented reality, robotics, and autonomous driving. Okay, so that's the transition we're looking at. And in particular, I'm gonna focus on the role of egocentric video. So when I say egocentric, it's synonymous with first person or wearable. So a mobile camera on the agent. So why egocentric video? Well, there's two things that motivate our work. And on the one hand, it's robot learning. We need robots that can understand how to navigate and manipulate in human-centric spaces. Okay, to move around the worlds that are created for people and to do it in ways that um, that, are, that are effective, and maybe even in ways that are like how humans would do it. And on the other side, in augmented reality, we need first-person understanding of the human experience in order to provide the assistance that's relevant at the moment it, it, that it's uh, needed. And that requires understanding of what I, as a user, am currently doing, seeing, and so on. Okay, so keeping these application areas in mind, now let's talk about what ends up being you know, a very first important question for building effective systems, and that is the data. So how will we train the egocentric models of the future? So if you look at first-person video in particular, you can see that there's been a number of efforts over the years starting to bring together wearable camera video um, in some scale uh, and in some variety. And so I'm just highlighting a few of those over the years, and these are inspiring. But when we look at the state of affairs, you know, just a few years ago, we see that there's limitations in terms of the scale and the diversity. So for example, the largest available resource in public egocentric video data sets was about 100 hours of total content captured by 45 unique individuals. So in the effort I want to introduce you to next, which we call Ego4D, this is a multi-institution collaboration that's taken place over the last two plus years, uh, we wanted to really push the envelope in terms of all the factors you see here. The amount of data, yes, but also the variety of the scenes in which these wearable cameras would be present and the variety and number of people who'd be wearing them. So let me t uh, give you a, a nutshell picture. What's that variety? What's that scale like? Here I'm carving out a rectangle in orange. That one axis represents the number of participants. That means the number of people wearing a camera. And on the... Uh, Horizontal access shows the number of hours of total content. And so that resource I just mentioned, Epic Kitchens, biggest that existed until 2020, um, occupies an area like you see there. If you took together all the egocentric video data sets from 2008, put them all together in one block, it would compare as you see there. Okay, so bring in Ego4D, the effort I'm about to describe, and this is what the team has achieved. Okay, it's an order of magnitude leap in terms of the scale and diversity of available data, comprised of more than 3,600 hours of egocentric video, of unscripted in the wild daily life activity. The people wearing the camera, more than 900 of them from 74 different locations around the world. The data is multimodal, and we'll see that it's video, RGB, but also audio, 3D scans, IMU, some stereo, multi-camera data. And importantly, with this data set, the team has presented a suite of benchmark tasks that are aiming at establishing the foundations of what we need in egocentric perception in order to make progress on many, many applications. And we provide the tasks with the data set to catalyze research further in the area. 
Okay, so this is a snapshot view of Ego 4D, and then in the next segment of my talk, I'm gonna get into um, the, the more specifics. And I, I need to kind of give the context of what Ego 4D video looks like, and then, and then we'll talk about some of its parameters. So here I'm showing you tiny excerpts from that 3,000 plus hour, hours of content showing you how Ego 4D is gonna give us a glimpse of daily life unscripted action all around the world. You can see that there's a lot of interesting hand object manipulation doing daily life things like around the house, chores, or at work from people who have different occupations. Uh, you also see that there's social elements to this data, people out in public spaces or in the home interacting with other people or even animals. Okay, so that gives you a taste of what I'm talking about in this huge repository. So now let's talk about how did we get it? So this is the team that came together, again, more than two years ago to form Ego 40. So what we did is put together a consortium of universities together with FAIR in order to assemble both world-leading expertise in video and data set uh, collection, as well as geographic diversity. So you can see all the different partners around the world who in their respective locations would be recruiting community members, um, participants to wear the cameras. So this is towards geographic diversity, but a, and also a tenant in the collection was to really promote demographic diversity. And I'm showing you some snapshots of what that looks like in the ultimate Ego 4D data set in terms of a few parameters. One, the age. So you may or may not be aware that common vision data sets, when you actively collect them on your own, often they're collected by students, computer science students, maybe most likely, you know, doing things. So you can imagine, and as people have in the most recent data sets, you know, giving cameras to grad students in computer science and wearing them about their daily life. That is not the case here. So explicitly, we wanted cameras in the hands of the people who, you know, sorry, graduate students are not graduate students. In fact, they have all the occupations that you see there, whether it's a coffee shop worker, an arborist, a landscaper, a farmer, a teacher, and so on. And these are folks from aged 18 to 84 and showing the geographic diversity I already mentioned on the outside of that ring there, as well as um, uh, difference in uh, gender. Okay, so 931 unique camera wearers from 74 locations around the world wearing cameras. Now, why did they do it? What is the draw? So um, these are participants that in many or many cases were paid to participate, but of course this was something that a participant wanted, had, to need, had to want to do to contribute. So, I find this really um, interesting to know. Here's a short excerpt of interviews asking folks, why uh, did you participate in Ego 4D? Um, I thought it would be a bit of fun. Me pareció muy chévere poder eh, mostrar o ayudar a visibilizar eh, actividades cotidianas de eh, países como Colombia que, nos, que son subrepresentadas en muchas bases de datos actuales que se utilizan. Ego 4D es un Ho deciso proprio perché ho animato un po' da questa passione verso la scienza, questa considerazione fruibile dell'arte verso la scienza in una, una possibilità. I think uh, participating in uh, science is quite important. I really like science and I love to help. I thought the whole cause of the data and what you guys were trying to do with it seemed very interesting and very cool to help out with. I believe it's always uh, amazing to be at the center of uh, cutting edge uh, research. La inclusión. La inclusión de todos los países, de diferentes culturas, de diferentes personas, y que realmente este proyecto va a contribuir a la disminución de esos sesgos que existen por cómo se recogen los datos que siempre son de los mismos países. Okay, so you get a, a, a glimpse of why folks were motivated to, to bring, come together to create this data set. Now, that's a bit about what's there and who. Um, as far as the capture devices, there's a variety. So the cameras that were worn include all the ones you see here, GoPro, Vuzix, Pupil Lab, Z-Shade, WeView. Um, a lot of the data is from GoPros, um, which a lot of um, the partners liked for the field of view and the ability to kind of tilt down and see very closely hand object interactions. Um, but it was intentional to have this be 
non-uniform. And the reason is you don't want the data set of what we hope will be 10 plus years into the future to be overfit to a single device, a single capture device. Now, what did folks do when they wore the cameras? So here too, very important is that we wanted this to be unscripted activity. So not the case that we would, um, you know, ask people to act out scenarios by name, but rather let's get the cameras into the hands of people who will be doing a spread of things in their daily life that in the end collectively will cover the kind of things that all people do in their daily life. And so the list you're looking at here is what the US Bureau of Labor Statistics say, um, find that uh, at least in the US, people largely spend their time doing. And that's things from everyday things in the home, things at work, errands, entertainment, exercise, transportation. Okay, so this was what the team was shooting for to get coverage of, but again, cameras went to participants who, through the course of their daily activity, were going to be doing um, many of the things on this list. All right, so a few more clips from Ego4D, now that I've introduced a bit more about how it's collected, what the kind of activities would be. You can see that we have both indoor and outdoor content. You have more solitary activities, but you also have social ones. You can see the really interesting visual contexts that come out from different professions. So by getting these cameras to people in different jobs, you see what that kind of interaction looks like day to day. Do you see some more exciting events? We started this collection right before many things shut down from COVID. So this was an early and more social element that was captured. And then you see that geographic diversity, a farmer in Sicily, um, or you know, we saw earlier someone shoveling snow in Minnesota. Okay, and I have to say, as a researcher, every time I look at clips from Ego4D or see any new ones, I'm just inspired for the kind of research that I know that we can do with it. Now, I said a moment ago that Ego4D is multimodal. So I've looked a lot, showing you samples of RGB pixels, these videos, um, but one of the important modalities that we wanted to push for here is to couple dynamic ego video, like the samples in the bottom row, with static 3D scans of the underlying 3D environment, as you see in the top row. So using Matterport 3D scanners, these environments were scanned first, so you can see the full layout and have a 3D representation of it, and now you have these uh, dynamic RGB trajectories from the camera wearer's point of view going through these environments. And this is really important for guiding new research that will bring together activity of people within a persistent 3D space. Another modality is to look at multi-camera input. So on the left, all the folks at this party are wearing an egocentric camera. And so you have the synchronized capture from all of their points of view, which brings out fascinating topics and understanding um, the, the environment, but also the social interactions within it and people's attention. Similarly, on the right, you see eye gaze captured from Indiana University, where you get the signal about where the attention of the user is as they're wearing the camera and doing something um, active in the world. Now, the final modality I wanted to highlight at the moment is text. So this is a first form of annotation that we did on Ego4D, which we called narration. And what it is um, are language descriptions in free form open text about every single thing that the camera wearer is doing. So people w watched the videos and then wrote sentences like you're seeing here. C removes the, the, the saw, C unpacks the wire, C is camera wearer, C um, puts the thread on the table. So step by step, play by play, everything the camera wearer does has been narrated in language. And in fact, times two on every video. And this is dense, so about 13 sentences per minute, amounting to more than 4 million sentences coupled with this Ego4D video over the 3,600 hours. Now we did this for a few purposes. One was to have some text interface or index into what would ultimately be this big block of video that not, no one researcher is going to watch. Um, and to allow us to bottom up form taxonomies about what are the objects and activities that are even present in this data set. Turns out, as we'll see an example in a moment and from others in the field, this itself has been a really rich coupled moda um, set of modalities for multimodal uh, understanding of video. Okay, so I've talked about Ego4D's goal, its composition, who's doing it, what's the video look like, what are the modalities. And now an important element of Ego4D is also its care and rigor in terms of having good privacy and ethics standards. So at the very onset of this effort, when all those universities came together, 
each partner went through a review, you know, usually called an IRB at the universities to determine what are the ethics and privacy standards for their data collection and management and inform consent. And so for consent, this means that forms were signed by all recorded people where relevant. And then furthermore, in cases where there were um, a need to de-identify, all the data has been um, de-identified and sort of removing personal information as needed from faces, screens, credit cards, or other things. This is actually very high value for a data set of this scale to have it collected with all these safeguards in place such that can now be licensed and used um, under the terms of the license. Okay, so that's the data. And um, I've tried to kind of show what's the diversity, what are we gonna see when we look around the world from a wearable camera. Now when the team came together, just as important as putting forth the right data resource for the community was to put forth the right tasks. What are the research problems that we can now tackle with this data and how can we evaluate them? So this is what we um, refer to as the Ego40 benchmark suite. So there's a set of tasks or benchmarks that we can formally um, pose and formally evaluate. And annotations for all the tasks I'm about to describe come with the data set. And so what are these tasks? Well, they move from the past to the present to the future of the first person visual experience. So from the past, we have a set of tasks that tackle episodic memory. So episodic memory consists of being able to ask questions about a very long history of video content. So given this history of all egocentric video from a particular point of view, where did I put my keys? Where is my wallet? Where did, did I leave the door open when I left? So any question, um, language-based or object-based, that can then be answered by models that look, scour kind of this long history of video. Moving to the present, we have tasks that look at hand object manipulation. So can we understand what the person's doing and how are they doing it? And again, you might have seen in some of those clips that richness of object hand manipulation. Also in the present, we have two tasks that are socially oriented and multimodal. And these are audiovisual diarization diarization diarization, being able to see the egocentric video and identify who said what, when, and social interaction, where we also wanna know the attention of the camera wearer. So who is looking, and, and those in the environment, so who's looking at me, the camera wearer, or who's talking to me. And then finally, the tasks looking at the future ask to anticipate what might happen next. So seeing the stream of video up till this point, can we forecast what will be the next action or actions that the camera wearer is about to do? Okay, so this um, set of tasks we defined the consortium together defined in order to couple with this data resource uh, um, challenges that we think the field can really push on to bring us to that next level of egocentric perception on uncurated video. And the annotation effort that went behind this um, was significant. And so more than 250,000 hours of annotator effort was necessary to get this kind of prepared data for these formal evaluations. And what's wonderful is that over the last year or so, through the different conferences you see listed here, participants from around the world, um, dozens of teams around the world are competing on these challenges and really pushing the state of the art. So our Ego4D team put forward a set of baselines. Um, you know, four to six months later, the field you know, took all those levels up and it just keeps going from there. And so we're seeing through these formal challenges um, just what kind of progress we can make on these really hard egocentric video problems. Furthermore, it's been really exciting to watch as the field picks up Ego4D to, yes, tackle those benchmarks, but also take this data in new um, and inspiring directions. And so what you're looking at here is a distribution of citations by area, citations of the Ego, original Ego4D paper just since the data set launch um, just over a year and a half ago. And so you can see that certainly in computer vision, yes, um, but also some really exciting findings from the robotics community, looking at this um, daily life view from the human point of view that can enrich representations that matter for robots acting in those same environments, as well as pick up from 
even psychology, linguistics. And indeed, Ego4D is a resource coming out of the computer vision community, but one that has implications for many areas and interdisciplinary work thereof, including robotics, as I mentioned, but also speech, language, augmented reality, audio, and 3D sensing. Okay, so if we've done nothing else in Ego4D, we've set a record about the number of authors on a CVPR paper. And so you can see the whole team listed here and all the universities that are part of this consortium that came together to take on this massive effort. All right, so let's move on in this talk where now I've shown you this data resource that's helping us to push this transition from disembodied to embodied perception. And now I wanna zoom in on the multisensory aspect in the remainder of the talk. So I said that you know when we think about first person perception, it's really not just a vision problem anymore, it's a multimodal, multi-sensing problem where we need to be concerned with all the ways in which this agent is observing the world. Ego4D indeed is a multimodal data set. I've already highlighted that. All the modalities like here, IMU, audio. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the modality of text language that I, that I um, showed you just a minute ago when I talked about how all the frames, all the clips of this video have freeform natural language content that accompanies them. So here's an idea that we will be introducing at CVPR um, this year called hierarchical video language learning. So we're taking those narrations on that 3,000 plus hours of video and exploring the representations that can be learned as a result. So there's some early work that started to look at this by putting uh, learning objectives that say we want all those sentences and their associated time-stamped video clips to be close together in some learned multimodal embedding space. So this makes a lot of sense of that you had those little clips with their statements like C is fetching the water into the pot, C is cutting the onions with the knife, C is dropping the chopsticks on the board. Now if you have the associated video clips, that's a great supervision signal, right, to try and bring the representations of both those modalities together. And there's been some early work doing just that um, for good effect of the representation learning. Here's where we come in with those descriptions of the video, we also have summaries. So those descriptions are kind of play by play. Well, at the level of the whole video, which could be you know, four minutes, eight, 10, 30 minutes long, we also have a summary statement of text. So across this particular video, that summary statement would be C, the camera where it made salad dressing with some oil and sauce. So this is interesting about the data. You have two levels of granularity. You have the parent statement, which is that summary of everything that happened in a nutshell. And then you have the children's statements, those play-by-play -play descriptions. So our idea here was to provide a new idea for representation learning with video language that would represent that hierarchical relationship. And our thought is that that high-level summary, well, that's describing the why. Like why, the intention, what's happening in this video. Whereas that lower-level clip-by-clip description, that's describing the what. Like really, the atomic actions that had to happen in order to do that step of the video. And so we'd like to bring these two together because the why is quite elusive in video understanding, right? So understanding or seeing the what, what, what um, is closer to us, but in bestowing that notion of why is something we really need to try and capture better. So in our approach, which we call higher VL, so hierarchical video language, we bring uh, learning objectives for both of those resolutions together to, to create a multimodal embedding. So at the child level, if you're familiar with contrastive learning, this is where we can take instances from here, either the text or video modality, and learn embedding functions, a visual encoder over here, a text encoder over here, that will map them close together for the respective paired clips. Okay, and that, that would be where, where you would start, right? So that's at the child level. Now at the parent level, We'll also do some contrastive learning, um, but here we'll take the sequence of statements, the sequence of clips from the language and the video, and encode an aggregation of those individual parts and impose some contrastive um, 
pairings on those, right? And so what are we saying here? We're saying that when you aggregate the visual content across the entire video, and when you aggregate the content of those descriptions across the video, they need to map close to what is that why statement, the summary text statement about the entire video. And this is where a lot of power can come because now you're able to glue together what we know about the play-by-play -play with what we know about the entire story of that video. And to make those representations, even at that clip level, respect that, um, that why, that overview summary. Okay, so both of these are trained jointly, both the clip and the, the summary level um, representations in order to capture this multi-resolution relationship between what's described and what we see. So when we do that, um, just to give you a, an intuition for what comes out, well, here are TSNI 2D embeddings of what the, the learned um, representation shows us on the left for the model I just described, and on the right for that baseline um, existing state of the art here called Ego VLP that would do this kind of learning only at the clip level. And so the smaller dots are for clipped and clip encodings, and the, the bigger dots are for summary encodings. And what you see is that on the left, now we're able to bring that why information, the intention of the action, into the encoder. So that the, the children representations are, yes, clustering together, but also they're grouped by and mapped close to that parent level summary understanding. Where, whereas that's not gonna happen on the right side because we only know how to map um, clip to description, child level um, information together. Okay, so having learned these representations from video language, then we then took them to town across the set of benchmarks, including Ego4D, which I've already introduced, that's in the bottom left, looking at a, that forecasting task, as well as other data sets from the literature, like Charades Ego or Epic Kitchens. And across these tasks, what we find is consistent improvement from having this hierarchical video language embedding uh, learned. And so I'm not going into the metrics or the exact details of the task, but to show you that when you have this kind of fundamental representation trained across such a massive set of data and leveraging this multimodal context, we can have a quite generic and flexible representation that succeeds in many downstream tasks. Okay. So I've told you about Ego4D. I showed you an example from our own work, leveraging Ego4D for multimodal learning with video and language. The remainder of the talk, I wanna go to the modality of audio and vision together. Okay, so audio visual learning. What happens when we are not just looking at the world, um, but we start to listen as well? So what are the things that when audio and vision come together become very interesting and perhaps easier to tackle? So this includes things like object identi identity, you know, the cat meows, uh, material properties, things bang together, and all of a sudden we understand them better, not just how they look, but how they sound. Emotion and human emotion from things that are verbal but also nonverbal. 3D spaces. So sound, as we'll see just shortly, is an important indicator about the geometry and physics around you. Conversation, people talking. I uh, already hinted at this with the audiovisual diarization diarization, benchmark in Ego4D. Um, so we, we learn a lot, not just from looking at the speakers, but certainly listening as well. Egocentric activity, so things we do in the environment, how they look matters, but also the sounds we make, whether interacting with objects or, or the, the state changes that evolve in the environment because of our actions, they often have sound. And finally, the scene around us, what it is, can be signaled by what we're hearing. Imagine closing your eyes, well, I don't know, finding yourself somewhere, closing your eyes and thinking about where you are and hearing the busyness of the coffee shop. This would be a really important clue. So all of these areas matter. The ones I wanna focus on in my examples today are 3D space and conversation. And we'll look at 3D space first. And so let me really give you an example I love to show how audio is exactly reflective of the space we're in, the 3D space and its materials.
Okay, one drum kit, five different spaces. So it was the same content, right? But as we move it to these different rooms, the geometry is different, the materials are different, and naturally the sound you receive is also different. That boils down a lot of important information about what we're trying to get at as we look at audiovisual content as something that can help us measure the 3D world, whether, whether or not we do so explicitly. Okay, so the spatial effects in audio, what are, they, what are they stemming from? Two things we wanna be mindful of. On the one hand, the 3D environment itself. So the geometry of the space, the materials in the room, and also the relative positioning of the sound making thing and the receiver or listener. The other important element is the agent, the sensors. So the, we as sensing agents have two ears, two microphones, and so that means we're able to do this spatial sensing because of factors like the time delay between the waveform hitting one ear versus the other, or the level difference as that same sound hits one ear versus the other, or even the outer ear shape, and which will give us um, information about the 3D um, layout of the sounds we're receiving. So these two things work together, the environment and our multi-channel audio. And what some of our um, work over the last few years has been doing is to try and give us a platform to really study this in depth. And so this platform that I'll introduce in two slides is called Sound Spaces. And it's for highly realistic audio simulation for training AI um, systems. And you, if you're familiar uh, with visually realistic 3D um, world representations that have been very important recently for embodied AI research, these are scanned environments. If you remember in Ego 4D, I showed you Matterport scans from environments that were captured. This has been done at scale for, at this point, thousands of different environments and data sets like you see here in order to have the ability to re-render in arbitrary positions in these real world multi-room 3D environments to do embodied AI research. Okay, so this is for the visual arm. Now think of sound spaces as providing this kind of re-rendering availability uh, um, ability for, for sound. And so what we can do in sound spaces is render the acoustically realistic binaural, meaning two ear sound in real time for arbitrary sounds. All right, so you insert waveforms and then you can render them in a space like this um, according to where they are placed and according to the geometry and materials of the, of the uh, location. Okay, and we've done this by allowing um, generation of what's called the room impulse response for any, any selection of a source and receiver location. And we've made sure this is compatible with a fast rendering platform for the visuals called Habitat. So what does it mean for you as a user? It means you could take an arbitrary 3D environment for which you have a scan or a mesh and insert arbitrary sounds for example, putting some sound source here, and now from any camera pose, you can render the world from that view. You can also render the audio that you'd hear as a binaural listening agent at that position. So what do these simulations look like? Let me give you one example here. When I play the video, on the left, you'll see the egocentric camera view, carving, you know, moving through some space, which for your kind of grounding is showing the 2D um, floor map on the right-hand side. And the thing to do is listen for the changing sounds as you move through this environment. Okay, so there's a pesky smoke alarm, there's also a piano, and I hope you could hear how the, the different sources would get louder as we moved closer or further, or louder or softer as we move closer or further from them. Furthermore, if you go to our actual source video and listen with headphones, you'll hear the respective left and right channels, and you'll hear the direction of those sounds as you move about. And all this is with state-of-the-art um, bi-directional ray tracing for the audio, done now in, in a way that's real time for sampling these views and sounds. So when we started this work, we were exploring it for audiovisual navigation, which I'm not going to um, get into today, but this is kind of an embodied AI task where you say, hey, here's an agent, can it go find the smoke alarm? And now it needs to learn policies, how to move about the space and do it. What I'm gonna show you today is how we're using this kind of platform for training 
uh, representations for audiovisual embeddings. And the first one I want to look at is, you know, again, in this zone of understanding the 3D space better from how it sounds, not just how it looks. And I turn to Hollywood to help us think about this for a moment, about what it might mean to use sound to understand the surrounding shape of the scene. Okay, so this character in Daredevil cannot see, but by listening, you know, after striking that gate and then listening to the results, can sense the general layout of the scene as well as what, um, where different objects are. So with a bit less drama, but with the same kind of physical motivation, we're gonna do some representation learning that will put that intelligence of how audio is moving in the space into a visual representation. And we call this idea visual echoes. And what we wanna do is learn features, so just learn encoders for RGB input streams that are enriched by echolocation during training. And what we'll want to know is how does this benefit downstream visual-only tasks? Tasks like depth prediction, surface normal estimation, visual navigation. And what I think is interesting in pursuing this direction is that what we're talking about is gaining supervision through interacting with the world acoustically. Right, so think about emitting a sound, just like the strike on the gate, and then listening to the results. That's an interaction with the physical world that allows you to sense it uh, for free um, in terms of uh, no manual uh, annotation. So to, to do this, let me talk about the data and then a bit about the method. So the data we can sample from sound spaces, the platform I just described, where we'll do echolocation. So that means we'll start putting the source and the receiver at the same position, the source emits, we listen there to the results, like what are the echoes? So we'll emit a frequency sweep and then listen to the echoes that come back with binaural recording. So for example, if I had a camera placed in the environment that we're looking at now, top down at that crosshair, and I look in a certain direction, I'll see the RGB in front of me, I can sample that image, I'll see the depth map as well, and I'll hear the echoes. Those two um, black matrices on the top, those are spectrograms for the left and the right ear. Now if I rotate the camera, I'll see a different RGB view and different depth map and receive a different pair of echo spectrograms. Same thing as we go around at different orientations, different positions in the scene. What we're collecting here is how the world looks and then how echo responses will be received when I'm looking in that direction. So now let's learn a representation from this paired data. Our goal is to learn a visual representation that's self-supervised. So self-supervised means, you know, there's no manual annotations coming in. We're gonna learn it from the data we have as like the training signal itself. And in this case, our self-supervised objective is to determine when the echo and the view agree. So it looks like this. You're doing training here. You see the RGB. You're gonna learn an encoder for the RGB stream. You hear the echoes. You're gonna learn an encoder for those um, binaural spectrograms. And the training objective is, can you predict when those two are aligned? So when we train, sometimes these will be instances that are paired, where we are looking in this direction and we are hearing from that direction too. But other times, we'll be looking in this direction, but the echoes we have coming in are from some other orientation like to the side or behind or the other way. And so our job is to know which is it. Are they in agreement or are they not? And if they're not in agreement, what's the offset? So we'll train these um, multimodal streams, we'll learn to fuse them, and then we'll train to predict that orientation. So why is this a good self-supervised objective? If we can look at the image and the audio and decide whether they align, it means we must find those elements in the image that suggest the 3D structure that will create the appropriate or inappropriate echoes. So what it does is lets the audio pull out of the visual content those things that are important for 3D spatial understanding. And that's exactly what we want because now if we've trained to do this task from this paired training data, we, can, we are left with an RGB encoder that's enriched by the audio spatial uh, intelligence. 
And so we'll take that encoder and do a few things. So let me show you the first one, depth estimation. Now that we've enriched this visual encoder with audio, at test time, we have just images. Okay, so these, this is a popular depth estimation data set called NYUV2, and you get a monocular image and you need to estimate the depth map. The ground truth is the second row, so um, red is far away, blue is close up, and then if you were to train an, a, a state-of-the-art model from scratch, you'll get the third row of estimates. And if you um, initialize that model with visual echoes that I just described, you'll get the bottom row. So an even more accurate estimate of the depth. So what's happened here? Well, it's sim to real transfer. So we trained this representation, in fact, from simulated data, from these rendered 3D environments, from the rendered sounds. But now we're taking it over to real world images and dropping the audio. So we just have real world images, sim to real transfer, and we're showing that that 3D, um, 3D information from the audio has indeed helped the visual representation. And this is really exciting uh, to see. Now we saw that qualitatively there, of course we've quantified all these things to look at what the numbers mean for depth estimation, as well as surface normal estimation and visual navigation tasks. And what we see across these different examples is that compared to scratch training, we're seeing a really nice improvement in accuracy. And in many cases, we're even competing with or getting better than heavily supervised pre-training, which means you know thousands or millions of labels from human annotators. So this is visual echoes allowing us to improve our multimodal representations, especially by geometry that audio reveals. I want to continue that theme with an example, looking at a different, really just a different parameterization of a 3D scene, which is a ground plane floor map. So here's the task. You have a short video. The camera doesn't see everything. So here's the camera. It's the blue cones moving over time in this scene. And um, if we saw a lot of this environment, we'd have no problem mapping it. But when we only see a portion with computer vision, we're, we're really handicapped, right? So there's some parts of the scene that just don't get observed. It really won't be possible to map them. But we think that with such a short video, if we consider it in this multimodal context, if we listen as well as look, then we'll be able to map a much broader area of the scene. And there's two reasons. One, the pure geometry of it, right? If I'm walking through the scene and observing multi-channel audio, and I hear sounds bouncing around behind me, I don't look that way, but I can all, I'll be able to sense that there's free space nonetheless. And two, the semantics. If I walk by a hallway in which I never open the door to the kitchen, but I hear kitchen sounds, this is a signal that I could start to learn that suggests there is not only free space there, but there's also a kitchen-like room. Okay, and so our goal in this work for audiovisual floor plans was to take short video content with audio and infer ground plane maps and even semantic ground plane maps that label the rooms by their type. Okay, so the model that we pr propose to do this um, uses cross-modal attention in an encoder-decoder network, so you're encoding the audio and the visual streams, and then you're decoding back out into those ground, ground plane maps. And you do this over time, so it's a sequential process, and as you get each new successive estimate, you stitch them together into the full output map. And that's what you're seeing on the right of this slide. So we train this in a supervised way, so we learn how to make these predictions of the, the ground plane maps, we see a strong contrast between what happens if we only look to receive this map versus if we're also listening. So if we are looking only, if you look at the, the left 3D rendering, this is a, a top-down view of a particular home where the camera went along the orange uh, cone trajectory that you see there. And if we only used um, computer vision, then we'll get the cyan region as our output map. Whereas if we use the audio and vision together, as we've proposed, you'll get that much fuller map that's shown in green. And the two, um, two flat maps on the right are just top-down views of that same environment on the top for our method on the bottom for what is state-of-the-art visual mapping that is not limited to what it sees, but in fact can extrapolate as well to unseen areas. And for those maps to be perfect, they'd be all green and black. Um, so anywhere you see red and blue, those are the errors. And so again, what you see is a fuller map that's more accurate because of this multimodal sensing for producing a learned uh, map. Let me show you a video of this at play. And here, this is taking place in sound spaces. 
And what you'll see once I play it is kind of a, a busy household. There's this sound, that sound, someone's typing, someone's knocking on the door. And as the camera moves about, we'll start accumulating the map on the right-hand side. Okay, so environmental sounds just kind of passively observed as the camera moves through. Again, the orange cones are the camera trajectory. If you were to map it based on what you see, you'd get the cyan floor plan. By mapping together with our learned model for the audio, you get the broader green region that's shown there. So this is exciting for you know, being able to take what's already available, in this case, you know, from a passive observer, in order to enrich this uh, mapping capability. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna show you is gonna look at that other element of sound um, that's so important when we think about audiovisual learning, and that is conversation. And here I want to address what's a classic problem for audio and now for audiovisual learning um, and for us humans, which is the cocktail party problem. This is this challenge of being in a busy place where many conversations and other sounds may be going on and you as a listener, an egocentric listener, being able to focus your attention on one sound of interest. Okay, so it's a classic problem. We do it to some extent. We'd love to have machines that can do it and in fact can enhance our ability to do it. So let me give you a, um, a sense of where the literature is for tackling this problem in the audiovisual domain. There's been a really nice kind of base, baseline approach that you can self-supervise. And what I mean by that is you can take pairs of video and start to learn how to disentangle audio by artificially mixing them together. So if you took two training videos and mixed their audio, well, there you are. You're holding the ground truth to know what the original sounds were. And so you can train to map from the input video stream and the mixed audio to disentangle and factor out what was the source audio for that stream. Right, so mix and separate. Mix during training and then learn how to separate to the original audio. This is explored in a lot of different work. Um, and it's a kind of a powerful paradigm to train with large scale um, networks, large scale data to do audio source separation. What I wanna show you is an element that we're bringing to this, looking at how vision, the role that vision specifically plays for the audio visual separation task. And to do it, I wanna motivate you with a quiz. So, your job is to listen and decide which face is speaking. I wonder if anyone could have a guess about what face that is. I see some number twos coming up. Yes, indeed. So, you know, you were looking at properties of this person's face that might suggest the audio would sound that way. Right? Here's one more. Being um, cool and, and you can see that in, in daily life. This one might be trickier. But I am seeing number fours, this is fun. Okay, so yeah, you're right. So this one came from number four. So what, what are you drawing on? Well, there's, um, you know, I don't know that you've seen these faces or voices before, but there's things about the appearance of the person, the gender, the, maybe the nationality, maybe um, the body weight, the shape of their face that's gonna play out in what you hear in the voice. And this in fact is well known, um, and folks have been leveraging this to learn um, cross-modal embeddings that try to associate how faces look and how the voices sound. And this has been effective in past work for doing person identification. Well, here's where we come in. What we observed is that this can actually go hand in hand with this task of audio source separation. And by that, I mean one task is gonna help the other. If we have the ability to separate voices well from mixed audio, then that'll give us distinctive voice tracks that would help us learn a better embedding that maps faces and voices together. And on the flip side, if we've already got a good embedding that puts the right faces with the right voices, then that would help us be prepared to look and listen and filter the voice out of the mixed audio. So in a nutshell, think about what we want to imp um, in part on these models is that ability to kind of listen for the voice you expect to hear. 
despite the fact that it's mixed with other sounds in the environment or even other overlapping talkers. And so we put together a model that uses the visual stream not only to observe how the face is moving, but also the, just the, the face appearance itself in order to simultaneously learn how to extract a source sound. At the same time, we're learning embeddings that respect the relationships between how faces look and how voices sound. And we call this model visual voice. And let me just show you some fun samples before we close here um, of what it can do. So, you know, unfortunately, maybe there's no shortage of times when people talk over one another. And so here's a, an input video where you see that happening. Well, you became no, a superstar. No, I did not. Yes, no, you I did. did not. No, sure I did not. Sure you did. From are me, you gonna, are I gave you full credit. Piece? If you're talking am, to me am, now, am I, I gave you piece? full credit for that. Am I going to speak my piece or not? Go am ahead. I going to speak my piece or not? Go ahead. OK, because you want to interview me. I ain't interviewing you. You want to talk to me. I don't, wanna, I don't worry about talking to you. want to talk to me. go ahead. I'm waiting on you. All right, so people talking over each other feed this audio and visual into the visual voice model. And here's what we could select for a target person one. No, 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 I did not. No, I did not. No, I did not. Are you gonna let, are you gonna let me speak my piece? Am I, am I gonna speak my piece? Am I gonna speak my piece or not? Am I gonna speak my piece or not? Okay, because you want to interview okay. me. Okay, and interview the you. other you source? Well, you became a superstar. Yes, you did. Sure you did. From me, I gave you full credit. If you're talking to me now, I gave you full credit for that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, another example that is really well motivated by augmented reality applications where I would like to have better listening for myself in a noisy environment. Here would be the original observation. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where you uh, have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. And here visual voice would allow you to target just the sound of interest. I haven't measured it, but it's cut down the noise um, to a point where we have the right vibe that it's an action kind of place. And my final example here, maybe one you've seen before, um, working at home, all sorts of fun things happen. And here's one with um, this gentleman is in, being interviewed on BBC. Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, Okay, so all kinds of in the wild background sounds. Let's see what we can do for this person. Um, I would be surprised if they do. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. Great. So I can tell I'm not the only one who, for whom this feels a little bit familiar. And, um, you know, I've given you kind of teasers what this is doing for us in practice. We've certainly evaluated it quantitatively across all the benchmarks we know of and getting really strong state-of-the-art results for audio source separation with video. All right, so I am going to close the talk here. What I've shown you is ways in which we're trying to move towards embodied, first-person, multimodal perception. I introduced Ego4D, this massive video data set, the effort of some 80 plus people in universities around the world. And then I showed you examples from our research that are really pushing for um, new ways to leverage multimodal content, particularly first person, um, in order to learn representations, encodings of a scene, and, and do tasks like the, the source separation that we just saw. Uh, at the bottom, I'm, I'm recognizing you know, the many collaborators from the consortium that we looked at earlier, as well as a number of students and collaborators for um, the work that I highlighted specifically today. And I'll stop here, say thank you so much for your attention, and be glad to have comments and questions. Thank you so much, Krista. <laughs> thank you so much. That was really fascinating. So much in, uh, interesting, uh, so many interesting topics there. If you have a question for Kristen, there's a microphone there and one there. Please stand behind the microphone. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Also, I'll mention, I, I mentioned my intro talk very briefly. We have speaker office hours uh, starting this afternoon and through tomorrow. And Kristen will be holding office hours this afternoon at 1.30. That's in the speaker square in the exhibit hall. So if we don't get to all your questions or you'd rather not ask in front of a large group, feel free to come to the speaker office hours at 1.30. Sir, go ahead. Uh, uh, just Kristen, uh, question, two questions really. One on, on generalization on the results. You know, very interesting work, very impressive results. 
have you have you been able to generalize it to a much more random unknown crowd and then using the data you have already recorded start to separate out the the, the voices and conversations that was one on the generalization and two is how far along have you taken it from industrial perspectives to use it in things like factories Okay, great. So on the first question, I think it's generalization to speak novel speakers to do the source separation. Um, and indeed, and across the data sets that we're looking at, and even those anecdotal examples I was showing you, these are speakers that we haven't observed during training. So it's generalizing to new speakers. Um, and as far as industrial applications, um, not from my own work. So this is pure research just for the models and um, what I showed not being deployed for any product yet. I think the question was uh, regarding the industrial aspect was less about commercializing, which I want to ask you about, but it's more about just like different kinds of environments, like more, you know, like a noisy factory. You can imagine this being, the source separation being super useful in a noisy factory. Have you tried like a diversity of environments against some of these techniques? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so to the extent they're represented in these data sets, let's see, um, since we're only one slide away, I'll put that there. Um, these data sets are often more of kind of people in, in either, you know, home or, or public environments like the ones I showed in the videos. You're right, they're not in a factory um, setting, so, so I don't know. Um, I, think, I think the, I don't have, I'm pretty confident though, the same kind of thing that we're doing there has reason to, to to work in the others. I mean, particularly if you train in them, but even if you don't, you get a lot of power from this mix and separate kind of paradigm because now you have the freedom to, you know, mix and corrupt the audio however you wish and then learn how to undo those effects. So I'm pretty optimistic for that, the generality of the scene type beyond even the five data sets here. Very good. Question, sir. Yeah, for the Ego 4D, how much was that labeled as far as at the polygon level? And how consistently was it leveled? Because uh, if you want to get something for training data, it helps for the data to be labeled consistently and with the same tags. Um, and also, how granular or what kind of hierarchy was it, like WordNet style? <clears throat> yes, thank you. So the annotations on Ego 4D cover about 17 different tasks among the five kind of family or three families I showed, you know, between past, present, future, et cetera. So, the types of annotations vary thereof, and you're asking specifically about polygons and kind of spatial annotations. Those come up in the task for um, forecasting and hand object interaction, where we wanted to know where are the hands, where's the active object, the object that the person's interacting with. And for those, we have um, bounding boxes or mask annotations for the things that, in terms of quality, I mean, kind of a general statement about the quality in Eagle 4D, this was done through um, professionally tr and trained annotator services, like um, uh, you know, vendors with which the, the research team had a relationship in order to you know, train and iterate and do QA and all of this. So I think quite good for that reason. And we did kind of things of you know, duplication or, um, across annotations. So quite good for that. Now they're not, I should say, you know, since you're interested in the polygons, it's not dense, right? So as I mentioned, it's you know, the active objects of interest as opposed to every pixel, every, you know, a full semantic segmentation of the scene. Um, but that's what we have on the spatial. And then correspondingly, you have different kind of tracks like temporal localization over here for this task or, you know, speech transcription over here for another. Yeah. Was there any kind of contextual labeling? Like if I wanted to search for videos that video segments that are just outside or at a construction site yeah. or inside in a kitchen, you know, maybe the exact image isn't labeled. You know, you've got the many labels, sentences per minute, and you the four minute. Is there any broader context? I guess you've got some of the maps. Yeah, that's right. So the text does a lot for this. And what I, what I didn't mention, but might be useful for, for someone wanting to kind of step into this data set, is we have what we call a visualization tool. It's available from the Eagle 4D website, the Eagle 4D Viz tool. And it gives you this kind of semantic index into the data by keyword search, by annotation type, et cetera. So you can do queries like, you know, outdoor, as you just mentioned, or, um, you know, scissors, like where is there anything with someone cutting or scissors? And a lot of that search is fueled by the narrations that we had, which are done, you know, by multiple people um, densely across the data. Um, and then others are from the, the manual labels from the different benchmark tests. But this tool is really what, so important for like a new user or any researcher using the data because you can 
browse. And I think when you browse, you either find the stuff that's relevant to you, or you know, you get inspired about what the you know what which research challenges in your current um, line of inquiry are actually supported by the data or could be taken in a way that are. <clears throat> Great. Let's go over to this side. Question, sir. How do you balance the de-identification of, for example, faces with the information content that faces convey, like being able to distinguish uh, speakers based on their lip movements? Yeah, definitely. So this has to do with how the data is partitioned. So there's kind of different portions of the data where the partners, university partners collecting it had the ability to get informed consent and signed consent forms for everyone who ever appears in the video. And for that, no de-identification is required. And so you have among the audiovisual and social interaction portions of the data, um, this preserved, like not only all the audio, but also all of the face pixels. Um, whereas there's other portions of the data where, you know, because of the IRB, you know, the camera moving through the grocery store, like these faces would be blurred. And so we kind of partition and align against the different benchmarks, um, the data accordingly. Okay, thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I find watching the first person video a bit nauseating. <laughs> and I think that's part of, because I'm a passive observer and I don't have control over the camera. And I wonder if, um, well, say if I'm teaching a robot to cook or something, the robot potentially has control over the camera and it can intentionally move. And, and it, so, I wonder if there's an opportunity for, well, how, how you might apply your data set to that ability to move the camera or if there's some you know, opportunity for further uh, data collection. Yes, yes. This is such a fascinating spot for research, um, certainly from going from, you know, so a vision I really appreciate is thinking of learning vicariously through people. So we observe people vicariously, you know, but we being AI agents in this case, you know, by watching this video and how they turn their attention, how they use their hands, et cetera, and then deploy that as like pseudo experience that gets your robot going, you know, much further along than it would have from, you know, its own experience exclusively. And indeed, this is a line of work happening in the literature. Some of it, you know, facilitated by Ego4D now. Um, <clears throat> and you're right, this is, and what you're calling attention to is that important difference in embodied AI between, you know, um, uncontrolled visual streams, which we have once we're watching people's content versus controllable, you know, action perception loop, which we have in robotics. But this, but this interplay is really happening and I think this is exciting. Um, we do have a speaker, um, Dinesh Jairaman, who's going to talk about elements of this, I believe a little bit later today, um, yeah. just down the hall. Yeah, excellent. Question over here. Hi, Kristen, thank you for your talk. Um, uh, how do you ensure a certain amount of standardization within your data set when you're dealing with so many different sensors and to so many different modalities? Um, open source data sets tend to keep, uh, stick to a certain amount of standardization. So how do you ensure that on Ego40? Um, I also had another question, but I'll wait for your answer on this one. Okay, could you say just a little bit more about what kind of standardization? Do you mean synchronization um, or? Potentially, uh, time synchronization, sticking to a certain resolution. Um, how do you answer, answer, uh, ensure a certain uh, pixel distribution across uh, maybe cameras and, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's kind of two aspects here. Um, one, you know, on the front of device and resolution and the rest, we actually did intentionally keep it open such that you know, every university chose which wearable camera they'd be using. Um, so there wasn't standardization there, again, to avoid kind of overfitting too much every model that comes out. <clears throat> um, synchronization was an important one um, for you know, the instances where we have multi-camera or for the audiovisual, And um, that was kind of a collaborative effort between the partners collecting this data and then even in meta, like internally with the ENG team, um, doing a lot of, you know, pretty intensive work actually to to make sure everything is orderly and um, that those modalities are aligned. Yeah. Um, my second question was, um, as someone who's put so much into collecting data, do you ever see the industry moving towards not needing data or using unsupervised learning techniques um, to doing our own uh, annotations or you know um, that sort of a deal? I think that's absolutely true. And you know, one way to look at Ego4D is it is, you know, the, the real power of it is the data itself. It's the fact that these cameras were there in the world, they got these pixels, and now we all have them for this research and the multi streams. 
I mean, we believe a lot in the benchmarks and what the annotations do there is, you know, at the very least, they're necessary to quantitatively evaluate what anyone's getting from their models. Um, but I do think you're right that, you know, where we can be headed here is once the scale of the data, the richness of it is so full, there's, as the literature is showing, you know, there's so much more we can do with self-supervised models, including on data like this. And maybe I want, this gives me a chance to tell you a favorite quote that one of our colleagues in the field made about Ego4D as we started to, you know, reveal it back when we released. Um, and if you're, if you're familiar with vision data sets, this will, you'll know what I'm talking about. He said, you know, it all started with MNIST. It'll end with Ego4D. <laughs> and so, you know, he has this compliment from, this was Serge Belangi from Cornell. He, at the time, he was saying, you know, look at how far we've come as a field from MNIST, handwritten digits, et cetera, to, you know, real world video like this. And, you know, can we, can we push from um, heavy annotation data being required to just big, massive coverage um, observations of the world as being the power that, you know, moves our models along? Awesome. I think we have time for one more question, sir. I think you mainly talk about the spatial properties. I'm wondering if you have learned uh, or, or used the temporal inf uh, properties of the physical world. Sure, yeah. So in, in this video, the temporal um, dependencies and evolution of activity is very important. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of what I showed today. You know, this is at play when we talk about the hierarchical vision language, uh, video language embeddings, where this is done at the, you know, at the clip level and the video level. So we're needing to keep representations that are, you know, not frame-based, for example, not instantaneous or purely spatial. Um, and then if you look at the Ego4D task suite, you must pay attention to dynamics and temporal information to do things like anticipate next actions, you know, to understand that typical sequence of behaviors in, a, in order to expect how it will unfold next. So those are a couple examples um, where, yes, for sure, this temporal is, reasoning is very important. Wonderful. I'm afraid we're out of time. Please join me in thanking Kristen for amazing presentation.